Um, it's great to be able to speak to some of my favorite people about one of my favorite subjects. It's sort of like I've died and gone to heaven. <laughs> um, if you um, look at this uh, uh, title page here, you'll see that there's a picture of me in the lower right-hand corner. And the story of that picture was it was taken about 10 years ago. I was younger then. And I had just climbed the 550 steps to the top of uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. And another law professor, who is now a law dean, was with me. And he took this picture while I'm holding onto the railing for dear life. <laughs> um, we were there uh, for that visit in 2005 for about, um, uh, for about four months. And I will say that toward the end, I was getting kind of homesick. I really liked Britain, but I was getting kind of homesick. But toward the end, we also recognized that we weren't going to be there forever, and we better do some traveling. And so uh, part of our traveling was to Gloucester. And we were wandering around Gloucester Cathedral, seeing all the signs about how parts of the Harry Potter movies were filmed in Gloucester Cathedral, you know, the part where they flood the floor and where the cat, Mrs. Norris, gets, gets uh, uh, paralyzed. Well, that's, that's filmed in Gloucester Cathedral. And I come, I come to this, and I choke up because there's the British flag and the American flag flying there side by side. So what's all this about? So I go and I check, and it turns out that this is an exhibition, or a little memorial, that's been put together by a cooperative effort of the Rotary Clubs of the United States and the United Kingdom. And what the, the person they are memorializing here is this individual, a guy by the name of John Smith, John Stafford Smith. Now what did John Stafford Smith do? Well, the answer is, he wrote a drinking song. <laughs> <laughs> to Anna Creon in heaven. And uh, this drinking song became very, very popular. Uh, sometime after he wrote this drinking song, there was a little bit, little misunderstanding between the United States and Britain, which led to them <laughs> shelling Fort McHenry near Baltimore. And Francis Scott Key wrote a poem, he's a young lawyer who writes a poem, and then that poem is set to the words of Anacreon in heaven, and it becomes the Star Spangled Banner. And the reason I told you that story is because that illustrates something about our British heritage. Now, I'll tell you up front, I am not, I don't have English blood in my veins. I do have some Irish blood, but you know what the Irish think about the English. <laughs> uh, so I'm, sp I'm speaking as, I'm, I'm not speaking as somebody who's got something to prove by by way of having English ancestors, I don't. But there really, uh, there, there really is a unique role that England plays in our heritage. And when the multicultural crowd tells you that the contributions of, I don't know, the uh, Algonquins are just as important. By the way, I am partly Algonquin. When, it, when, when they tell you that the, that the contributions to America of the Algonquins are just as important, they're blowing smoke that the English heritage is far and above more central and more important to our legal system, our constitutional system, our society than almost any other. Uh, there are some close seconds, but it is way up there. And so the Star Spangled Banner story illustrates that. You've got an English song, an American poem, and Americans adopt the English song to the American poem for their own purposes. And that is something like what happened in Magna Carta. Now, we're going to discuss today three different things, basically. You know, here's the, the, the format. Um, I'll be talking about some clauses of Magna Carta. You may never have read them, but if you ever read the United States Constitution, you will, you will hear the echoes of Magna Carta in the Constitution. Secondly, we'll say something about Magna Carta's universality. Magna Carta was a medieval charter. Magna Carta was not a Bill of Rights. It was not a constitution. It was a medieval charter, but it was a medieval charter unlike any other ever written. And so we'll talk about that briefly. And then thirdly, how Americans adopted Magna Carta, much in the, much in the way, more elaborate way, that Americans adopted an English drinking song for their national anthem. Okay. First, we'll start with some history here. 
Uh, I hope we have enough time for this, but I think it's worthwhile to do a little bit of English history so you get the, the pattern. The, by the way, the flag here is the flag of England, not to be confused with the flag of Great Britain, because the flag of Great Britain has a Scottish cross of St. Andrews superimposed on it. Okay. Uh, at the time of Magna Carta, England had been a very severely divided country. Let's take a look at a map of it, because sometimes Americans have trouble keeping straight, you know, what's the United Kingdom, what's, what's Great Britain, what's England, and so forth. Today, the United, today, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland consists of four separate countries, literally four separate countries, Wales, England, Scotland, and part of Ireland. Um, Wales has actually been connected to England since the time of Henry VII, Henry VIII. For, he came to the throne in 1485. He was a, he was a Welshman. Uh, so Wales has been pretty well integrated into England for the most part. Scotland, still a separate country. You know that they had a referendum recently about seceding from the, from the United Kingdom, which struck me as the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life, but it got a substantial part of the vote. It lost, but then they went ahead and elected uh, Scottish nationalist parties to their parliamentary positions. So the Scots like being part of the United Kingdom, but they've got some real reservations too. And then there's Northern Ireland as well. Okay. Now the history of England up until the year 1066 is of successive invasions from the continent. Uh, the, or the originally England, Great Britain, uh, Great Britain generally was Celtic, right? Celtic. These are the people. The, the Greeks call them Celts. The Romans call them Gauls. They're the same people, okay? And they speak originally a language called Gaelic, which is related to our languages but distinctly different. Um, so England was, or England, Great Britain generally, was a Celtic country. The Romans invade in 43 AD, and they gradually conquer what is now England, and a little bit of Wales and Scotland, but basically England. And they bring with them the Latin language, they bring with them Latin law, and eventually they brought with them Christianity. And so England is a Roman province for about 400 years. And if you've ever been to a place like Bath, England, you know how Romanized it gets. Or not just Bath, you walk down a street in London and all of a sudden you see an old wall and what is it? It was built by the Romans. So the Roman presence was very much in England for a very, very long time. Okay, so what happens next? Uh, in, the, in the third century, well, really in the second century, but the third, fourth, fifth century, AD, you see one of the great migrations of history. The great migrations of history, the Germanic, the movement of the Germanic people from the north into the Roman Empire, the so-called barbarian invasions. In order to meet the threat from the barbarian invasions to the core of the empire, in the early 400s, the Emperor Honorius withdrew the Roman troops from Britain and said to the British, you're on your own. Now by this time, remember the Britons are their Romans. They speak Latin, they follow Roman law, they live the Roman life, they're Christians for the most part, and suddenly they're left unprotected against savage invaders from places like Saxony. And they defended themselves as best they could. You've all heard of the King Arthur legends. King Arthur is portrayed as a medieval king. He actually was not. Historically, we believe that King Arthur was, in fact, a Romanized Briton who spent his reign fighting, trying to fight off the Saxons, ultimately unsuccessful. So what happens? Well, what happens is that the Romans flee to the western part of the country. If you go to Wales today, you'll notice two things. Number one, the signs are in two languages. The signs are in English and they're in Welsh. Welsh is a Gaelic language. When the Romans conquered Britain, they conquered uh, England, rather, and, the, and the, uh, the, the, the Celts remained, the Gauls remained in Wales. Then when the Romans left and the Saxons came in, the Saxons submerged England. And what did the Romanized Britons do? Well, some of them ran to Wales. So if you go to Wales and you go to a grocery store and you see the, you see the signs for food in two languages and you look at the English, that's clear enough. If you look at the Welsh, you'll see there's a lot of Latin and Welsh. And that's because of the Roman influence. It's not Latin and other Gaelic languages. So... So you have a flood of Romans who displaced the Celts. You have a flood of uh, Germans 
who displaced the Romans. And then in 1066, you have the third and final flood, and that is the Normans. Now, the Normans were originally Vikings. Norman means Norsemen or Northmen, originally Vikings. But they had settled in France, and they had developed a certain veneer of French civilization. They spoke French. Uh, the Parisians might look down on the quality of the French they spoke, but they spoke French. And so in 1066, as a result of a dynastic dispute, William, the Duke of Normandy, invades from France, comes into England, kills the last Saxon king, and um, uh, becomes William the Conqueror, the beginning of the Norman line. From that time for the next two centuries, England is divided between a thin group of people at the top, the barons, the royal family, and everybody else below them, okay? At the top, we've got people who speak, speak French. When they, do, when they describe the product of a cow, they say manure, that's a French word. When the Anglo-Saxons describe the product of a, canal, of, a, of a cow, they use a different word, right? And if you think about it, there's that duality in the English language, that's the reason. The Normans brought the polite words with them. Up until maybe shortly before the time of Chaucer, the languages didn't mix that much. And so you have a few Normans at the top, French speakers with large holdings in France also, and you've also got the vast majority of English people speaking an earlier version of English at the bottom. And again, think of the legends of Robin Hood, you know? Robin Hood is, although a Norman himself, he's defending the oppressed Saxon against the Norman tyrants. It comes from that same era. We don't know really when or whether Robin Hood lived, but the stories are told of essentially the time of, around the time of Magna Carta. Okay, so England is a divided country. So um, what in the world can bring the, what in the world can bring these classes together? What in the world can convince them to work together? The answer is, a really bad man can do that. A really bad king can do that. One of the scholars, David Carpenter, who um, uh, helped advise on the British Library's Magna Carta exhibition, calls King John a really nasty piece of work. And that, and that was about right. I mean, he really did bad stuff. And, uh, and so as a result of that, um, the barons undertake a rebellion, and perhaps to their surprise, they find that they're not alone, that they're, that they're joined and they're given material support by the English underclasses, by English freemen, by merchants, and others, because, they, because at one time or another, King John had extorted stuff from them. And as we go through Magna Carta, we'll see uh, examples of that. Okay. Um, Rather than go into the background details right now, let's just go into some of the clauses of Magna Carta, and we can continue the story through that. The first one, all merchants shall have the right of safe and secure exit and entry to England, and of stay and travel throughout England. It shall be lawful for anyone to leave our kingdom and to return, safe and secure by land and water, except for a short period in time of war. Now notice something about this. The first thing about this is this isn't for the benefit of the barons, is it? I mean, it may have been the barons who extracted Magna Carta, but this is something that's there for the benefit of the merchants. In fact, it's really for the benefit of anyone who wanted to travel. Freedom of travel, which is now, of course, enshrined in the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court as a constitutional right. It's viewed to be part of the Privileges and Immunities Clause. I'm not sure that's exactly correct, but that's the Supreme Court doctrine. Freedom of travel is considered fundamental to our constitutional system. It was in the Articles of Confederation. But uh, So two points about this. One is this shows how Magna Carta echoes in our own founding documents, but it also begins to show that Magna Carta is more than about just the barons. Okay, here's another one. All fish weirs. What the heck is a fish weir? Anyone know? Yes, Peg. When the, water, when the water flows through, you have to provide for the fish to get through. That's the modern environmentalist definition. That's not the traditional, but yes. It's a trap, that's right. It's to catch the trap. 
And so, and so the, the, the king had built these, the, the, the king, the, to, to catch the fish, the king had built these fish weirs on, on, um, on uh, uh, rivers all over England, and they were impeding navigation, right? Well, who's this, what's, who, who's this clause for the benefit of? Well, it's for the benefit of anybody involved in commerce. It's not really related just to, just to the barons. You'll notice also that the Thames River is mentioned, the Medway River is mentioned, and then tagged on after that is throughout all England. We'll see that again. Okay, here's a map of the, uh, of the rivers of England. You can see the Thames. Here. This is the Medway. But you can see that it's a country that whose interior, at least at the time of, of Magna Carta, was reached mostly by boat. Anybody ever see a clause like this before? Where? Hmm? In the Bible? Any American uh, documents? What? It's in the Constitution. The Constitution gives Congress the power to set uniform weights and measures. It's actually considered, it was originally considered part of regulating commerce. Uh, who is this for the benefit of for? Well, it's the benefit of everybody. Anybody who buys and sells goods gets the advantage of uniform weights and measures. Now, this is not the stuff that gets the headlines when you talk about Magna Carta. One of the quarrels I have with the British Library exhibit is the British Library exhibit spends a lot of time talking about really some of the really famous clauses where it's clauses like this that probably wound up benefiting more people more often than some of the more famous clauses. No scootage or aid. Scootage is a um, scootage or shield money is what you pay if you don't do military service. No scootage or aid, and aid is a kind of feudal payment, shall be imposed in our kingdom except by common counsel of our kingdom. And for obtaining the common counsel regarding the assessing of an aid, we will cause to be summoned the archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, and greater barons. One of the things that King John did, which annoyed people, was he assessed taxes. And he assessed them arbitrarily and he assessed them at very high levels. So for example, he might say to a Jewish money lender, you want to stay in business? You owe me 10,000 marks, pay up. He did this sort of thing all the time. And so that's the reason for this clause. If the king wants to impose uh, scootage or aids, he better go through the common council of the realm. Now, what does the common council of the realm become? It becomes parliament. It becomes parliament. And so at this stage, it's not yet parliament. At this stage, it's just a bunch of nobles. But later on, it becomes fundamental doctrine of Englishmen, whether they happen to live in America or Canada or Britain or anyone else, anywhere else, that people may not be taxed without their consent, either given directly or through their representatives. And let the city of London have its ancient, all of its ancient liberties and free customs. Furthermore, all other cities, boroughs, towns, and ports shall have their liberties and free customs. Well, one of John's games was to say to a city, <clears throat> um, we, have a prop, we have to recapture some of our land that we own in, Fra own in France. Um, you're going to help us out. You're going to send us... Uh, you're going to send us 20,000 pounds, and you're going to send it by next month. And then the, uh, or uh, we're going to take away, or the king might say, we're going to take away a privilege that you have because you harbor some, one, some of my enemies or whatever excuse it was. And, 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 and uh, the way you can get your privilege back, city, is by giving us payment. So John was constantly inflicting people with bad stuff and then making them pay in order to get out of it. He also would pass a law 
and then agree to exempt people who paid up. Does this sound familiar? You pass a law, and then, or, or, or there'd be a law that maybe he didn't pass, that it always existed, and then he would say, I'm selling exemptions today. No village or individual shall be compelled to make bridges at riverbanks, except those who from old were legally bound to do so. In France, this was called the duty of corvée. You know, a city or a town or an individual family was given the responsibility, just assigned the responsibility to do something. You guys repair the bridge. You know, you guys fix the road. That corvée was one of the contributors toward, toward the French Revolution. One of the reasons it never got very far in England is it was stopped largely by Magna Carta. A widow, after the death of her husband, shall forthwith and without difficulty have her marriage portion and inheritance. Another one of King John's um, uh, games was the following. Um, Mary here is married to a wealthy lord, and he kicks over, okay? Um, she then expects to inherit his property, or at least a third of the property that she's entitled to as a widow. John says, Mary, I share your pain. <laughs> I'd like you to share, too. <laughs> um, if you wish to get your inheritance, you have to give me a share of it. And so it was to stop this sort of practice that this clause was included in Magna Carta. No widow should be compelled to marry so long as she prefers... Ooh, ooh. Where are we? Sorry about that. I made a mess here, didn't I? No widow should be compelled to marry so long as she prefers to live without a husband. Again, we'll go back to poor Mary. Her husband died, and John says, you know, it'd be great as a reward for what Jack here has done for me. As a reward, I want to give him Mary's property. And so what I want to do is have him annul his marriage to Emily and then he'll marry, he'll marry uh, uh, Mary. And Mary says, well, you know, Jack's a really good guy, but there's a little bit of an age disparity. And, and John's response is tough. You want to get out of it? Pay. <laughs> and so this was going on regularly. Magna Carta says that particular practice will stop. One other thing, and this is important. Magna Carta is written in medieval Latin. The word Magna Carta means great charter. Literally, actually, it means big parchment, but great charter sounds more dignified. Um, throughout Magna Carta, there are grants that are given to all libri homines. And if you read translations of Magna Carta, libri homines, the people who receive these grants, is sometimes translated as free men. In fact, however, liberi homines means free persons, including women. So anywhere in Magna Carta where there's a reference to a gift or a grant to liberi homines or to the singular liber homo, women are included. The very first chapter, the Magna Carta is divided into sections called chapters. The very first chapter of Magna Carta has a provision in it which basically says the king agrees to leave the church alone. The king is not to meddle with the election of church officials. The king is not to mess with church doctrine. It is to leave the church alone. Now, that did not mean that England became a haven of freedom of religion. But it did begin the long trek that eventually led to the disestablishment of religion. Not in England, but in the United States. If an heir has been under age and in wardship, let him have his inheritance without relief. Without relief is a kind of feudal payment and without fine when he comes of age. Again, same kind of deal that was going on with poor Lady Mary here, 
was going on with infants like Frank over there. He, if his father died when he was 14, when he reached 21, he would ex be expected to get his inheritance. What King John was doing is he was appointing guardians of the property who would loot the property and then fail to hand it over to the heir when the heir reached 21. I mean, this was a really bad guy. Actually, hey, Joe. Yeah, 21. Protection of property. No constable or other bailiff of ours shall take wheat or other chattels. Chattel means personal property. No constable or other bailiff of ours shall take wheat or other chattels from anyone without immediately tendering money therefor. Anybody recognize any parallels in the U.S. Constitution? What is it? What? Which amendment? Hmm? It's the takings clause. The takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. The recognition here that when the crown takes property, it must pay. Neither we nor our bailiffs shall take wood which is not ours, except in accord with the will of him whose wood it is. Well, same basic, basic principle. If you want the wood, you got to buy it. No sheriff or bailiff of ours or any other person shall take horses or carts of any free person for transport duty against the will of said free persons. Again, notice here, who benefits from these? Well, barons can benefit from these provisions. But in the first one, chapter 28, that seems to apply to everybody. Chapter 31 seems to apply to everybody, even serfs. Chapter 30 seems to apply to all three free persons, free persons about half the population of England at the time. All crown preserves, these are called forests, that have been made such in our time shall forthwith be annulled. Now, comment on this. The term forest, you know, you and I, we think of the word forest, we think of a bunch of trees. We think as a, uh, a synonym for wood, for woodland. The word forest comes from a Latin, Latin word which simply means outdoors. It's the same root as the word forensic because cases used to be argued in the forum, outdoors. The forests were large tracts of land of over which the king had assumed jurisdiction. The ability of individuals to use the land or to buy the land or whatever or to, to uh, uh, take advantage of the land was prohibited or severely restricted. The crown controlled as a result of the forest laws vast tracts in England, many of which were not wooded. There's one tract in England called the New Forest, still exists today. The New Forest is down in southern England, in Hampshire, I believe, and it actually doesn't have much wood on it at all, and it's called the New Forest because it's relatively new. It was a forested, I think, I think in the 1100, so it was fairly new. Still called the New Forest today. But this was, this was uh, government land from which the people were effectively barred. And part of King John's record was in grabbing more of this land and aforesting it, making it part of his royal domain. And the result was a system where huge tracts of England became controlled by the crown, controlled by the government. Now that could never happen in this country, fortunately, right? No bailiff shall upon his own unsupported assertion accuse anyone without credible witnesses brought for this purpose. In other words, you've got to have witnesses if you want to prosecute somebody. Any parallels in the U.S. Constitution? Sure, the requirement of indictment or presentment of a grand jury. Okay. Judicial procedure, to no one will we sell, to no one will we refuse or delay right or justice. Well, another one of John's games was to 
say if you want to hear your court case heard reasonably early, it's going to cost you a thousand marks. If you want a, fa a favorable result of the court opinion, it's going to cost you somewhat more. We will not appoint as justices, constables, sheriffs, or bailiffs anyone unless they know the law of the realm and mean to observe it well. In other words, the judges have to be learned in the law. And now we come to what is probably the most famous clause of all. No free person, no free person shall be taken or imprisoned or dispossessed or outlawed or exiled or in any way destroyed, nor will we go against him except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. This particular clause uh, was in the original version of Magna Carta. It became uh, reproduced in later forms of Magna Carta. This particular provision is one of the few parts of Magna Carta still on the statute books in Britain today. During the 1300s, the term law of the land uh, developed a synonym. A synonym was used for it, and the synonym was due process of law. So this is actually the origin of the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. It's the origin of the due process clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. The story by which this occurred, or part of the story by which this occurred, is a really horrific one. It involves this we don't have, really have her picture here, but woman Matilda de Bruse, who was practically a legend in her time. This is a woman who uh, was um, married to uh, a noble. She was noble herself. They operated as partners for many years. Uh, certainly they partnered a good deal since they had 16 children. But in addition to that, their, 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 their castles were located on the Welsh marches, marches. That means their castles were located in the boundaries between England and Wales. And they were constantly fighting off fierce Welsh warriors. And she was very much of a military leader. For example, she, she uh, directed the defense of a siege that had gone on, for, that went on for three weeks until she was finally relieved. She fought actively. Uh, as well herself. Um, she was generally a supporter, and her husband were generally supporters of King John, uh, until one day, John, claiming that her husband owed him money, John was always claiming that people owed him money, told uh, Matilda that he wanted her to give him her eldest child as a hostage until the money was paid. Matilda, Lady Matilda, I want your son as a hostage. Her, she didn't really say anything there, but shortly thereafter, within earshot of the king, she said she was not going to hand over her son to any king who had murdered his own nephew. The king was furious. She had to flee to Ireland. She was eventually apprehended. She was locked in a castle, along with her eldest son, and starved to death. This happened five years before Magna Carta, and it was on everybody's mind. If this can happen to Matilda, with her record, with her legendary reputation, it can happen to anybody. So this particular provision protects all free people men as well as women, women as well as men. Neither we nor our bailiffs will seize any land or rent for any debt as long as the chattels of the debtor are sufficient to repay the debt. Okay, you don't go after the land if the personal property is sufficient. A free person shall not be fined except in accordance with the degree of the offense, yet saving always his capital, and a merchant in the same way saving his merchandise. And a serf shall be fined in the same way, saving his farm equipment. A serf is protected here. And none of the aforesaid fines shall be imposed except by the oath of honest men of the neighborhood. Any echoes in the U.S. Constitution? Yes. The Eighth Amendment. 
the protection against excessive fines. Traditionally, what excessive fines means, or part of what it means is, when you find something, when you find somebody, you don't set the fine so high that you take away his livelihood. King John used to wander around the country and his courts would follow him. And so if you had a case, you had to run after King John. Magna Carta provided that that process would stop. Courts would be held in one ascertainable district. The U.S. Constitution makes an oblique reference to that as well. And then a truly extraordinary provision. All of these aforesaid customs and liberties, the observance of which we have granted in our kingdom as far as pertains to us toward our vassals, shall be observed by all of our kingdom toward their own vassals. In other words, we the barons who extracted this from the king, who insisted upon certain rights and privileges from the king, we agree to give the same rights and privileges to our own vassals. To my knowledge, there was nothing that had appeared in any other medieval charter like that. Yes? Sorry? A serf is not a vassal. A serf is, but a freeman would be a vassal, a free farmer. Another extraordinary clause in Magna Carta was the security clause and this is kind of how it worked. If people believed that the king was violating Magna Carta, they could go to a committee of barons. A committee of barons was set up, 25 barons. And there would be a subcommittee of four, and you'd go to the subcommittee of four, and you say, King John is retaining my castle, or King John has taken my goods in violation of Magna Carta. Do something about it. The committee of four would tell King John, we've got a complaint against you, and John would be required under the security clause to rectify the complaint. If John didn't rectify the complaint, then the matter would be reported to the full committee of barons, and the full committee of barons could enforce the terms of Magna Carta or the rule of law against King John by seizing his castles or doing almost anything else they wanted. It was a way in which the subdivisions of England, the controllers of the subdivisions of England, could discipline the federal government. Does that sound like anything you might have heard of? Where the subdivisions find a way to discipline the federal government. Well, <laughs> sounds like Article 5 of the U.S. That's right. It sounds like the state convention procedure. Now, am I saying the state convention procedure was, did that come directly from Magna Carta? No. But the founders knew Magna Carta very well. And they, at the Constitutional Convention, they talked about the idea of using the states to check the federal government in the same way that baronies protect, uh, check the federal gov central government in England. The question then becomes, why are these terms so broad? Why is it that Magna Carta isn't just like what most medieval documents are, medieval charters of a kind are, and that is a, a litany of benefits to the barons. Well, the historians have debated a number of different reasons. They've looked at prior charters. There are a few provisions of Magna Carta that do have precedence in prior charters, but they don't really explain it. Uh, many people have looked to Stephen Langton. Stephen Langton was involved intimately in the negotiation of Magna Carta. Uh, Stephen Langton was Archbishop of Canterbury. Stephen Langdon was also one of the most respected theologians and uh, uh, biblical commentators in Europe. As a young man, he had gone to the University of Paris, and he had stayed at the University of Paris, which was the leading university at the time, and he stayed there for many years lecturing. Langdon was known to believe that kings should be bound by the rule of law. And so many folks believe that Langdon had a role in that. By the way, Langdon left his imprint in other ways. Next time you pick up your Bible, take a look at the order of books and the chapters in the Bible. That organizational system, that's Stephen Langdon's. It's also true that at the time, there were a lot of, ide a lot of ideas current 
um, in the church, in the law, in academia, about things like the natural equality of all human beings. People were talking about this. Uh, people were talking about the duty of a king to be constitutional and to follow the rule of law. And so it wouldn't have required Langdon to actually tell people about that because anybody who was aware of the intellectual client, uh, climate at the time knew about it already. Uh, in many cases, it was the interest of, in the interest of the barons themselves to assure a fair deal for those beneath them. And then also remember a point I mentioned earlier. Magna Carta united England in a way that nothing ever had before. And so you don't just have the barons really opposing John. You've got barons, and you've got merchants, and you've got freemen, and you've got churchmen, and the list goes on. OK, a little bit of subsequent history. Uh, Magna Carta, as signed by King John, was almost instantly repudiated by him. And um, that, because that's the kind of guy John was. <laughs> almost immediately repudiated. The barons rebelled again against, against him. They brought in a prince from France to help them get rid of John. Fortunately, John did the best thing he'd ever done for England by kicking over. He died of dysentery the following year. And when he did, um, the regents of his son, the new king, Henry III, who was only five, nine years old, the regents of the new king, in order to gather support for the crown, reissued Magna Carta with some changes. So Magna Carta became reissued in 1216. It was then reissued again in 1217. And then, under the tutelage of Archbishop uh, Langton, Henry III reissued it a fourth time in, 20, in 1225. And that became the authoritative version that went on to the English statute books. The, the document was, was sent at various times all throughout England. It was sent to every cathedral in England. It was sent to the, uh, to the county governments of England. It was generally read in, uh, to, to the populace in Latin and in French. We believe it was also read in English. So people were aware of it. And we have many pleas, that is to say many court cases, where people rely upon Magna Carta from the 13th, 14th century. So it becomes part of English con uh, consciousness. During the 17th century, during the 17th century, there was a struggle by Parliament, largely led by the great English jurist, Sir Edward Cook, against James I and Charles I, okay? Part of their arguments against royal absolutism were, of course, Magna Carta. When our founders uh, picked up the revolutionary gauntlet, in many ways they saw themselves as the heirs to these folks of the 17th century, the folks who had relied upon Magna Carta and who had also written the Petition of Right and the English Bill of Rights. Cook discussed Magna Carta in his book on English law, which became the most important book on the subject and remained so for over a century until Cook's book was uh, superseded by that of William Blackstone. And Blackstone also wrote a tract on Magna Carta. His views were slightly different than Cook's, not a whole lot different, but he also had great veneration for the doctrine, document, and therefore an entire generation of lawyers who, including our founders, who learned their law from Cook and Blackstone, learned to respect Magna Carta. Even before that, Magna Carta, however, had come to America. A number of constitutional type documents adopted in the colonies paraphrased parts of Magna Carta. Also, the document was recognized as the supreme law of the British Empire. So if a colonial assembly passed a law that violated Magna Carta, if, for example, the Virginia House of Burgesses passed a law that put someone in jail without trial, that's a violation of Magna Carta, right? And what did the courts do with such a law? They struck it down as void. Does that sound like something you've heard about before?
Everybody claimed ownership of this document. Let me just finish up with a finish up with an observation here. I would submit that the people who extracted Magna Carta from King John did a very great thing, a very brave thing. But you know, when men and women do great things, they don't just do it so that future generations can passively admire them and talk about how great they were. They do those things partly so that future generations will have a model of their own an example that they can follow in their own actions. Our country today is very different from England at the time of Magna Carta. But there is one significant similarity. And that similarity is that we have a government that increasingly feels itself released from the rule of law. We see exemptions being given for political favors, just like under King John. We see the law being stretched out of shape to justify official acts, just like under King, under King John. And so that if you believe that the people who extracted Magna Carta were great men, then I think it's fair to ask yourself, what would they have us do? How would they have us act to vindicate the same principles that they were willing to die for? I'd be happy to take any questions you might have if we have time for them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, be, be, uh, lady behind you. You wanted, are you deferring? Oh, go ahead. Uh, was there something unique in the Magna Carta that gave women this standing? Um, yes and no, but mostly yes. Um, there were earlier charters, that, for example, that protected widows uh, from being kicked out of their husband's uh, property. Um, so there had been earlier charters that, that did provide some protection for widows. But earlier charters, for the most part, benefit only barons or you know, men, in other words. Um, so that, and, and the term, the Latin term, you know, is really clear. It's inclusive. It means person. Yes, sir. <clears throat> a vassal is someone, a vassal is a free man who is within the feudal system. A vassal could be a lesser lord. A vassal could be a farmer. Um, if he's free, yes. On the other hand, if he's unfree, if he's a serf, if he's tied to the land, then he's not considered part of the feudal system. He's outside that. Um, Magna Carta did not extend very many benefits to serfs. There were a few where they talked about homines, people, and that would include serfs. And in the case of uh, a serf's property being taken from him for debt, there was a specific protection which said that he had to be able to keep his farm equipment. So he's protected in that way. However, there's no question that in Magna Carta, the barons got the most protection, the merchants got the next most, all free people got the next most, and the serfs got the least. Magna Carta is not to be confused with a modern declaration of rights, okay? What makes Magna Carta different is not that it provided complete rights to everybody, but that it provided some rights to everybody. That's what really made it unique. It was a step, a step along the road, big step. Yes, sir.
It's a great question. This is not a natural law document, okay? This is not a document which says all men are created equal and endowed by the creator. This is a document which, in the, which is in its form a grant. That is to say the king is granting certain benefits to, um, uh, to the people. The technical term for that, the constitutional term for that is privilege. He's granting certain privileges to the people. That's not entirely true, however, because these privileges were in many cases the product of customs and of law going back centuries and were often traced and claimed as such. There are many references in Magna Carta to the, to the effect that you know, I would do nothing in, a, in contrary to the ancient law. Interestingly enough, when the Americans, American colonists, started arguing their case against the Stamp Act, for example, or against uh, British taxation, or against British, the British trying to take away the right to trial, trial by jury, they, they initially made their argument based upon the rights of Englishmen, of Magna Carta, the rights that people had had either by royal grant or from time immemorial. As the revolution came closer, Americans increasingly began to make a natural law argument. And of course, once the revolution, once independence had been declared, Americans abandoned the right of Englishman argument and resorted only to the natural law argument. Let me see if it's someone who ha hasn't had a question yet. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, the word serf comes from the Latin word servus, which is exactly the same word used for a slave. However, you are right to assume they were conceptually different. Uh, at this time, I don't think there were very many slaves in England. A slave is pure chattel. He has no rights whatsoever. Okay? Um, uh, unless there are particular laws against cruelty. But generally, a slave can, as you say, be be moved around. The surf is tied to the land. That obviously is a big disadvantage for the surf, but it's also an advantage for the surf. You know, a, a slave, for example, in the American South could be sold downriver, could be separated from his family. You couldn't do that to a surf. The surf had the right, in fact, the obligation to stay on the land. Um, also, there was kind of a contractual relationship between the lord and the surf. It was a much more uneven contractual relationship than between a lord and the vassal, but at least it was a contractual relationship. The lord had the obligation to protect the serf, for example. A lord couldn't throw the serf to the wolves. He's a, part of what the serf gets in exchange for his labor is this protection. So it is, even though the word comes from the same origin as slave, it is a step above. It, it uh, offers certain protections. This is about half the English population at the time of Magna Carta. It used to, believe, used to be believed it was more, but um, uh, there has been research in the subject with probably about half the population, and then maybe 5% are merchants or, no, or lords, and then maybe 45% are free, free farmers. Yes? Do I talk about laws? Were laws immemorial codified anywhere? Um, well, again, yes and no. <laughs> um, but the better answer, I think, is no. These are, in many cases, simply laws that were understood as part of the customs of England. However, many or some legal writers began to codify them quite early. Uh, there was a legal writer whose actual identity is not known, but he wrote under the name of Flata. Uh, there was an, another one, Henry Bracton. Uh, and there were others who made an effort to codify the laws of England. There was a tract going, a tract, a popular tract at the time of Magna Carta called the Laws of Edward the Confessor. Edward the Confessor, the Saxon king, shortly before uh, uh, William the Conqueror came over. And it purported to be a set of laws that, that prevailed under uh, Edward, the, Edward the Confessor. So the, generally this law is unwritten, but there were increasing efforts to codify it. And by the way, that was part of John's problem. 
you know, as he sees this attachment to the to this common law of England growing, uh, his actions increasingly look like the actions of a rogue. By the way, I want to make one clarification about John. John was no fool. John was the son of a very brilliant king, Henry II, memorably portrayed by Peter O'Toole in The Lion in Winter. So he got some brains there. His older brother was Richard the Lionheart, a highly capable warrior. So John's no dummy. But he was one of these guys who was smart, calculating, and could be smooth and charming one minute and stick it to you the next. We, we've had political leaders something like that, haven't we? <laughs> How are we doing on time, Justin? Uh, maybe one or two more questions. To two more questions. Yes, Peg. Yeah. Uh, in one of the earlier medieval charters was issued uh, in 1100 by Henry I. Uh, and Henry I made certain promises about not kicking people out, off their land without due cause and so forth. And that coronation oath, oath was repeated by Henry II. It was repeated by Richard the Lionheart. It was repeated by John. And there's no question that John violated it in a royal way, but John also violated many other norms and customs. And so that helps to explain why Magna Carta went so far beyond any of those early earlier oaths. One more question? Yes, Mike. Um, I would think that he writes, he says that do, during the time period, I would think natural law would be a very powerful tool at that time. Any ideas to why, why, why it wasn't used? You know, it was talked about. Uh, there was natural law referred to in Roman law. Roman law had recently been, uh, the, the, the great compilation of the Emperor Justinian had been recently recovered, Roman law. Uh, the, 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 the folks in the church and in academia and the, you know, the, the law academies are talking about natural law. So you think it could have been used but you know, that's not really the English way. The English tend to think in terms of you know, very incremental conservative sorts of theories. The most conservative theory that will get you there is the one they use, okay? And I think we see that tendency here. Um, it was, uh, and it's more defensible to say, look, John is violating the rule of law. He's violating existing laws. We don't have to argue about the content of the laws that God may have laid down. I mean, there's concrete laws in England that he's violating. We know about these. There, you know, there's no question about them. And so it's an, it's an easier it's an easier theory. Again, it's a great um, it's a great example of the difference between the French the the uh, English mindset and the mindset on the continent. I'll, I'll just leave you with one one story. When I was uh, uh, at that same trip at Oxford, I I befriended a professor at the local business school. And he was on one of these European Union uh, commissions, okay? Um, and basically what they worked, he worked with people from other countries on developing uniform standards, uniform regulations for trade and other economic activities. He said whenever it looked like there was going to be some kind of resistance to a rule, that people weren't going to like a rule. He said the approach of the French and German representatives always was, how can we get this through without the people really knowing about it or without riling them up? So, or how can we cram it down their throats? And the English response was, well, maybe if they don't like it, they have a good reason not to like it and we shouldn't adopt it. <laughs> Americans think more like that too, I think. Thank you all very much.